Welcome to Chats with the Chief. I'm John Jensen, Chief of Staff at the Veterans Health Administration, and this is the podcast where we get to make small talk about the largest integrated health care system in the country. This week, I'm joined by Dr. Matt Miller, Director of the Office of Suicide Prevention. We'll talk about supporting veterans in their time of greatest need and how VA is making headway in ending veteran suicide. Enjoy the show. Matt, thank you so much for joining us on the show. It's so great to have you here. I always appreciate it running into you in the hallway and having some great conversations. And uh, and you know you you got to be one of the smartest guys I know. And I'm not just saying that. Um, uh, you you have always a way of really telling and describing some things that may be difficult for people. And I just really appreciate the way that you do that. And so this is what I hope to have some these kind of hallway conversations that we have today and be able to discuss some of the great work that you're doing as well as to everybody to learn a little bit more about you. And uh, so maybe before we get started, you could do uh, a little intro of who you are and kind of how you got to be where you're at today. Yeah, it's, I want to say thank you for that intro. And it's always a pleasure um, working with and, and talking with you, John. I remember uh, hosting you and Dr. Stone at the uh, Atlanta uh, VCL call center. And uh, at one point we left the conference room and I was supposed to take you to another location and I walked you in a complete circle and you were, you were very gracious about that. So yeah, uh, our hallway visits have gotten better since then. So, uh, but always nice talking with you and I wish that, uh, wish that I could be there today. I'm here today at the Saginaw VA uh, in Saginaw, Michigan. And uh, it's really nice to see the team here and what they're doing on the front line. So it's nice to connect with that. Um, by way of background, um, before I was the director of suicide prevention, I was the director of the Veterans Crisis Line. Uh, prior to that, I uh, got my start in the VA here at the Saginaw uh, VA. I, was, uh, I started as chief of mental health here and then I became the deputy chief of staff in charge of access and quality for all clinical services. Prior to that, I served uh, in the United States Air Force. I know we have our bantering back and forth about Army we try, versus yeah. Air Force. <laughs> uh, was a clinical psychologist within the, within the United States Air Force. I specialized in work with fighter and bomber pilots, joint services. Well, great. And, you know, I think you definitely have the hair for the Air Force, and uh, I'm still sporting my Army haircut cut after seven years of being out of the Army. So we, we, we can keep up uh, both of our services uh, pride. <laughs> well, it's, it's funny you mentioned that. The first time I got in trouble in the Air Force at officer training was the hair and length of hair. When I got my hair cut, going to officer training, I thought, surely this is short enough. And uh, I was sitting in the auditorium very first session and one of the instructors walked by and uh, he said, Captain Miller, stand up at attention. And he got out a ruler, measured the hair on the side and the top. It was supposed to be a quarter, no longer than a quarter inch on the top. And um, I, I blew it. I think it was at least half an inch. So, Straight to the uh, BX in the barber shop. <laughs> well, now you're in the VA and you can have your hair as long as you want. So that's even better. <laughs> so uh, what we like to do uh, on these podcasts is uh, is kind of just do some introductory questions. These are kind of, I'm going to say rapid fire questions, but they're really just questions so the audience can get to know you a little bit better and they're kind of set throughout it. And this is a little bit different than uh, kind of normal where well, we've been in person, but uh, this is kind of what everybody's going through in, in having uh, conversations, meetings, and decisions that come out of Teams meetings or Skype or any other kind of, uh, of these different video type things. And so, I mean, this is kind of just normal every day to uh, everybody really in, in the world about how, how things are, have progressed uh, through the pandemic. So what book, movie, or television show or something that you're watching um, is is something that you would want other, you think other people should see or read or watch that would be interesting? Mm -hmm. I, I, you, my team's gonna laugh at this because they, they know this about me. I, I famously 
do not have the longest attention span. It's difficult for me to sit still for an extended period of time. I just get antsy. So I don't watch a lot of movies. I had been hearing repeatedly, Matt, you got to watch this movie. And I fought it. I fought it. I fought it because I don't want to sit for two hours. And I fought it because I, I had conceptualizations about it and perceptions about it. So the movie was the one with uh, Tom Hanks about uh, Mr. Rogers. I think it's called A Beautiful Day oh, in the yeah. Neighborhood. And uh, finally, one night, I just decided, okay, you know, people have been talking about this. I'm, I'm going to watch it. And the first scene almost almost did me in. I, I was like, okay, this is going to be, this is what I thought, you know, I, I'm not doing this for two hours. But as I continued to watch it, uh, by the end, I have to admit, I was, I was crying. I mean, I was literally crying. It was such an incredible, I think, uh, portrayal of the value and the importance of a purpose-driven life, of uh, clear focus and priorities, and sticking to those priorities and that focus in a disciplined way, day in and day out. It was, there was a quote that stood out to me in particular. At one point, Tom Hanks's character as, as Mr. Rogers, um, was, was talking about uh, emotions. And he, he, the, what he said was, we can learn to manage our emotions. And I thought, oh my goodness, that is that what he's been doing with all of this in this show? I mean, all along, what he's really teaching is learning to recognize, acknowledge, right. and deal with the emotions that normal human beings experience day in and day out and the difference in life it can make when we learn to handle such things well. And it was just a, it was a uh, interesting awareness to me that, oh, so that's what he was doing all along in the show. And that's what these back and forths were about. And, uh, I just, I really enjoyed seeing that play out and coming to a new awareness of that. I enjoyed the reminder of the importance of priorities and focus and discipline day in, day out. Wow. I, I have not seen that, but uh, on your recommendation, I will go see it. But I also Check appreciate, it out. I appreciate, you know, that perspective. And, and it is interesting, even just hearing you describe it of how, uh, how Mr. Rogers, uh, for those of us that remember Mr. Rogers, and I know you're much older than me, so I only got yeah. to see a couple episodes, but yeah. uh, that, that uh, he did that, and that's the way he tried to relate with people, with all people, and uh, understand them, and understand what they do, and I can, I can see where it would get to that. What piece of advice have you ever gotten that you have never forgotten that you tend to, I don't know, maybe live by or share with other people that you always have thought was important or unique? Mm -hmm. I, think, I think two things immediately uh, come to mind. One is from my very first chief of staff in the VA and my second is from my dad. Uh, the first one from the chief of staff, it, Saginaw really took a chance on me as coming in as a chief of mental health. I mean, that's a, that's, I had no VA experience. Um, I was coming in and I had military experience, but not VA and it's a different world. But as part of that, the uh, chief of staff asked to meet with me every night at the end of the day for six months. So every night at the end of the day for six months, I would go to his office in the quad and uh, he would sit me down and we would talk through the day. And it was, it was mentoring, it was, it was coaching, it was supervision. Uh, it was just a fantastic opportunity. Now, I have to admit, as the clock hit seven, eight o'clock each night, I would think I, it would be nice to eat some dinner and get home here. But um, I appreciate all the time that he invested in.
Um, but what, one of his first quotes and most frequent quotes was, Matt, no bad hires, meaning um, cutting corners in the recruitment and hiring and training process will cost you exponentially down the road and will cost the mission down the road. It is much more important to pay attention to the details at the outset. That's right. And if you don't have a selection that you are convinced is exactly the level of excellence that's needed for the mission and for our veterans, don't hire. It would be better to to re-engage in a new way than to check the box and say, I, I made a hire. You know, that, that stuck with me, yep. that I am in this role in many ways a gatekeeper to the quality and excellence of services that veterans receive. And part of that is what we do through recruitment and just as importantly, retention yep. of our invaluable team members within the VA. You take that time on the front end, you don't have to worry about it on the back end. And you know, right. we can't do what we do for veterans if we don't have a great team around us. And so I, that's just great, very important. And it's a great quote and something I'm gonna try and take back with me as well. So, um, so you mentioned before, kind of at the beginning about you were the director of the Veteran Crisis Line. and and about our visit to Atlanta. And, and I tell you, one, uh, and I've been to some fantastic places and met some fantastic people in the VA. And the, the, the great thing about the people at the Veteran Crisis Line is that they do this work day in and day out, outreaching to veterans, talking to veterans that are in crisis, and not only veterans too, by the way. Um, and so, and I know you were the director at, uh, at the VCL. So, could you talk about that a little bit? I'd like everybody to kind of know the kind of people that go into that kind of work and also the kind of work that they do there. It's, it reaches and touches so many veterans and it's not just a phone call. It's much, much more than that. So maybe you can talk about that a little bit. They're sitting there and that phone could ring at any time. And when that phone rings, anything could be on the other end right. of that phone call in terms of the person, the need, the challenge, and the opportunity. And, and they answer that call literally every day and then come back the next day to do it all again. The, the willingness and ability to do that one day is exceptional. Right. The willingness and ability to do that every day, day, in and day out. Is, is beyond admirable to me. I truly felt in that role like I was serving the most important people in the world in terms of um, those who are willing to answer that call. I, I was humbled by it every day. You walk around the Atlanta call center and you, you walk down that hallway that I got you lost down. And um, you, just, you just look at the people who are there answering calls and talking and waiting for the next call to come in. And uh, it, whenever I needed perspective, yep. I got up yeah. out of my chair, I walked down the hallway and just watched in amazement at the front lines. Yeah, I, I have to say it is the exact same same words. Um, special, humbling. Uh, they really put into perspective. Uh, I mean, giving of yourself or giving of your all on a mission that you don't know how it's going to start nor how it's going to finish, and you're going to be on on there the whole way through. And so we not only have the call center in Atlanta, but we have the call center in Canandaigua. Um, mm -hmm. And and I'm sh I haven't met the folks there, but I'm sure they're the same type of people. I'm just so um, amazed and um, honored to be uh, serving with them in the VA. Just amazing people. Are we making any headway in, in ending veteran suicide? Are we making some uh, difference into it? We see these figures all the time come up on the Hill or in the press and talking about veterans, uh, 20 veterans uh, a day lose their life to suicide. Is, is, are we making some progress on this, Matt? Definitively, yes. 
I, I, I do believe that we are making progress. When you take a look at the fact that we have now clinical practice guidelines that tell us what is evidence-based and they're starting to give us ideas and traction for evidence-based care, specifically addressing suicide prevention, that is incredible progress over the last decade. When you take a look at the work that VHA is doing with our veterans and you see from 2005 to 2017, the one line that's going down with regard to suicide is the line of veterans diagnosed with a depressive disorder in treatment in the VHA. To see that group, that high risk group going down across such a period of 2005 to 2017 means the work that the front lines are doing right. matters, and it is making a difference. Another point that demonstrates this, if you, suicide's going up across the nation, it's not just veterans. And our annual report is very careful to highlight that fact. If you look at rate of increase in suicide, the rate of increase is slower and lower veterans in VHA care than for veterans who are not in VHA care. It's slower and lower for female veterans in VHA care versus not in VHA care. So can we make a difference? Yes, we absolutely yep. can. Are we making a difference? Yes. This is what it makes it worthwhile for me, I think, to go into work every day and serve this mission. This is what gives me some semblance of peace yeah. with regard to moving forward from John's death. Well, and I'm, and I'm sorry for your loss, and I, and I think you illustrate even our director of the Office of Suicide Prevention has a personal story that's related to it. And I would say in this day and age, all of us have those stories of yeah. a, a colleague, friend, family, a friend of a friend, uh, there's a connection, I think, to all of us in, in, um, in the unfortunate uh, death by suicide. So what, what can we do? What can an individual do that's in our medical centers or at home or walking down the street or at a store? What, what, can, what is something that somebody can do um, to help in veteran suicide and in suicide in our society? Yeah. So there's, there's three... Um, foundations there's three principles there's three i mean to cut to an even deeper level truths upon which va suicide prevention is is anchored and built uh principle number one suicide is preventable it is not inevitable principle number two suicide prevention will require a public health approach that incorporates the world's best clinical care with community connection and integration and uh, involvement as well. And that's really, that's really the new aspect of, or a new aspect of suicide prevention within the VA is not only are we focused on the six veterans uh, who, who die by suicide per day, but we're focused upon the 11 who are not in VHA care as well. And that's where the community-based and public health approach really comes in and is necessary. The third foundation is um, we all have a role to play. Yep. Suicide prevention yep. will require all of us. This is the theme of our Suicide Prevention Month, be there. And it's emphasizing that everyone has a role to play. And it starts with showing up with the mentality of be there. I, I'm sometimes asked, so what does that look like practically speaking? And um, I, I just go back to my own life and, and try to illustrate from that sometimes in ways that I think I did OK, and sometimes in ways that I think um, I just, I blew it, but maybe other people can learn from it. Um, 
In, in terms of simple ways and illustrating, um, one thing stands out to me. You know Reagan, Reagan International uh, Airport. You know the uh, the terminal that the Delta typically flies out of. It is packed, and you're there's nowhere to sit mm -hmm. most of the time, especially on a, on a Friday afternoon when everyone's uh, leaving town. I was I was standing at Reagan. And I was standing in line, according to their queue, for where where I fit uh, for priority boarding or non-priority boarding. And um, I, I was I was waiting for the boarding call. I looked, and there was another flight who was lined up in a similar manner uh, facing us. I there's not a lot to look at, so I was just. Kind of looking around and i noticed there was a young lady standing in line and she was crying and it looked like she was trying her best standing in that line to fight off the tears and i mean you know the strategies we all use looking up looking around going like this um those those sorts of things and um finally she's wiping her eyes and um she's she's struggling and I, I found myself thinking, gosh, I wonder, I wonder what's going on. I, I wonder if she's okay. I, I hope she's okay. And then I thought, wait a second, why don't you do something? I go, oh, you can't do anything. That would be, that would be odd. Like, she, she could probably use a Kleenex. It looks like she's looking around for a Kleenex and doesn't have one. So I got out of line. I, I spot be gone in terms of uh, standing there waiting for your seat. And I went on a search in Reagan for a Kleenex. Believe it or not, it's really difficult to find a Kleenex at Reagan International. But I found a Starbucks napkin. I figured that'll probably work. So I took the napkin, I walked up to her, and I handed her the napkin, and I said, I hope this helps, and I hope you're okay. And I turned and I walked away as she smiled and said, thank you so much. And I have no idea what happened in her life. I have no idea what was going on. What I do know is that seemed like the best way to be there at the moment and walk that line of um, too little, too much, and just offer a yep. form of support. I. There's a lot of things I think that we do to talk ourselves out of those sorts of things. Uh, the second story briefly illustrates this where I, I blew it. I was, I was sitting in a restaurant with, with my daughters and um, we were eating and uh, all of a sudden my daughter Faith sitting across from me said, Daddy, is, is that guy choking? I turned, I looked over my shoulder and yeah, there was, there was a guy choking and he's standing up at the table. He's giving all the universal signs of choking. He's, he's coughing, he's gagging. Uh, someone beside him is going, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And I found myself looking over my shoulder with my daughters and thinking, gosh, I hope someone does yeah. something. I hope someone goes and helps. And I asked myself the question of, well, why don't you? You have BLS training. Why, all you have to do is the Heimlich. It's not that hard. Why don't, why don't you? And I was thinking in my head, no, what if I mess up? Right. What if I don't do it right? What if something goes wrong? What if there's someone closer who knows him? And this whole time I'm thinking, I'm not helping. And this person is clearly in distress. Well, finally, someone gets up and they administer the Heimlich and the food item is dislodged. And I just remember being really ashamed of myself that I allowed those questions to get in the way of me doing something when someone clearly could benefit from right. it in a life-saving way. And that to me was very compelling in linking to be there and the importance of we probably all have that experience of asking those questions of self-doubt, uh, those statements of, 
no, not me, maybe someone else, maybe someone's closer, maybe someone's more qualified. I'm convinced that if we can push through those types of doubts and those types of questions and we can reach out, we will make a difference with people's lives broadly and with suicide prevention as well. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And, I, and uh, it, we all have these kind of episodes, like you said, and I think the number one thing is just act, do mm -hmm. something, make a step to mm -hmm. do so. But we do have these, I don't know, cultural norms that may hold us back or not allow us to do it. But, you know, you might only have that chance once and making that difference count. Right. And, you know, my time in the military, and I'm sure as you described your time in the military and being around um, service members and now veterans and employees, we all have a commonality that we all have a, an idea of something bigger than ourselves. That's the reason we go into service. That's why, the reason we go into healthcare. It's the reason you go into military. Uh, do you want to do something uh, maybe bigger or broader than you are? And so I think finding no matter who they are about finding a place to, to reach a common ground and say, are you all right? Are you doing okay? How are things with you? I think makes a, makes a big, broad difference. And you described several things that, that we can do or that are, that are being done or uh, uh, you as an employee or a veteran or any, somebody in your community can do. You know, there was uh, one of the things that you can do is save training. Uh, we just began that here in central office as part of our onboarding of all employees that come in as they receive SAVE training. Um, SAVE training uh, has save, saves lives. Uh, mm -hmm. There was uh, so, some uh, OGC attorneys in, in Minnesota recently within the last year or so that had received SAVE training and somehow a veteran found them that was in crisis. You know, a veteran just trying to call numbers for somebody to help. And uh, because of safe training, they knew what to do. They kept the veteran on the phone, kept talking to the veteran, and the other, vet, the other uh, attorney uh, got a hold of the veteran crisis line and they linked them up and they were able to talk with this veteran. So the crisis line was able to take over and the great work that they do. But that's just some of the ways that they didn't just say, I, you know, I don't know how to do this. I'm not trained mm -hmm. in doing this. You don't have to be trained in doing it. You just have to be trained to do something. And, that, and I think that that's the conversations we all should be having. And, and especially today with COVID going on and the sense of isolation and aloneness, um, I'm sure that's leading to some other things. And so are you seeing anything uh, in COVID and this, this sense of isolation that is affecting uh, our veterans, our employees, or really just all of us? Yeah, it's hard. I, I think that we know from a human perspective, we, we need connection. I, 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 we all like to think, I think, at least I do, maybe I should just speak for myself. I like to sing the Simon and Garfunkel, I am a rock, I am an island. And the, the, the tougher we are, the more we can, we can live in such a, such a paradigm. But it's, it's just not true. It's, it's, it's not true. We need connection. We need to feel like we are making a contribution, that we have a place within the bigger picture, and we are contributing within that place and to uh, the bigger picture. Isolation is, um, I mean, gosh, in its most extreme form, it's, it's a form of punishment, right? There, there's a reason for that. Right. It, it, um, it impacts human beings. So are we seeing some impact of that? Yeah, I mean, that's one of the reasons why we went from uh, talking about um, uh, social distancing to talking about physical distancing. The importance of while you maintain appropriate physical distancing, that doesn't mean yeah. that you socially uh, disconnect. And so that's been an important point of focus. We've also been trying to reflect that in what we do within the VHA by looking for creative ways and promoting creative ways to continue to connect with veterans. I know when COVID first occurred in mid-March, we just forget the grids, forget the schedule clinics, pick up the phone, right. we'll figure out the coding yeah. later, but pick up the phone and make contact with veterans. And we exponentially increased phone contacts. And I, I believe that that's been important. 
since we've been building and increasing video connect. And I think that's important. Uh, we've got all kinds of interesting projects with Walmart and others for ways to connect more locally using technology. All said, though, the important point here is that um, maintaining social connection, we all need it. Veterans need it. It's one of the things we thrive on within the service in our own way. And um, it's, a, it's important to maintain. It is, and you, you think about it even today with wearing masks wherever, wherever you go, um, not, not too long ago, that when you wanted to make a connection with somebody or maybe show empathy towards somebody, you just smiled at them. You can't mm -hmm. really do that now with a mask. And so I've seen a lot more waving and thumbs up and, and uh, yeah. maybe elbow touches, uh, which may not be advisable in the physical distancing side of it. But those are the type of things that we all are yeah. looking for, those connections. And as, as we kind of figure out what the new normal looks like uh, as, a pan, uh, as we are at in the pandemic, um, I think these are the things that we need to look for. And these are looking yeah. for opportunities to outreach to veterans through phone calls, tel telephone, uh, TV, video, social media, whatever the case may be, and just to be there, as you mentioned about our campaign, uh, be there for veterans. And, um, and you know, in this month of suicide prevention, I, I just thank you so much for being on, but also thank you so much for what you're doing, what your teams do, what the Veteran Crisis Line does, the mental, Office of Mental Health and the Office of Suicide Prevention and all of our suicide prevention coordinators and mental health professionals in our facilities. Um, you're reaching to veterans and understanding where they're at to help them to be what they want to be and to help them uh, be better. Um, and your discussions, your thoughts here has really helped us to be able to figure, look out for ways in our own communities as well as at work and with our veterans to find ways to, to outreach to them and be better with them. And, and I just can't thank you enough, Matt, for taking the time to be on here on this month of suicide prevention, which I'm sure you're very, very busy. Uh, and so with that, do you have anything that you wanted to leave us with before we go? It, I have a serious case of uh, imposter syndrome, uh, which, which is this, this fear that um, uh, you, you don't deserve or merit um, that which is, is um, positively directed towards you. And I, I have it uh, crop up when I, when I listen and you graciously offer those words. I, I, I redirect those that praise to everyone on the team. As we talk right now, I've been, I've been seeing on teams, love teams, um, <laughs> this, uh, this, this, these pop-up messages and it's, it's my team sitting in meetings and working on something. I see some of the questions going back and forth. And I'm thinking, that they are doing the important work of building behind the scenes that I have the easy job of talking about front stage, but all that heavy lifting, all the, all the work, that's, that's the backstage stuff that I even right now see uh, popping up in this, in this chat off to the right of my screen. And I know is occurring uh, within uh, phone calls right now to the VCL. So I deserve no credit. Uh, all the credit goes to the team and I'm just privileged and honored to do this. With that said, I truly believe we all do have a role to play. Suicide prevention is not Matt Miller. Suicide prevention is all of us. That's right. And John, I really appreciate the role, the leading role you've played in this, the support that you've offered in your position. It's really important. And uh, we view you as a critical part of this as well as, as well as your team. So thank you. Thanks, Matt. I really appreciate it. It is critical. This whole this suicide prevention is critical and we have to do something. And uh, just again, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us, Matt. Um, and uh, God bless you and all the folks that, that work in mental health and suicide prevention. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. I hope you enjoyed today's conversation. Join us for our next episode where we get to chat with Ryan Lilly, Network Director of the VA New England Healthcare System. See you next time.